Well, I'd like to begin by thanking all of you, both uh, NASA employees and contractors, for all your work, your very hard work in making the SVS-77 mission both safe and successful. And, uh, you know, when we were up on orbit, uh, some 180 miles above the Earth, we were continually reminded of the tremendous teamwork that it takes to bring one of these missions off. We're inside Endeavor, and it's just humming along beautifully, and that's due in large part to the hard work of the folks down at the Cape, as well as many other centers around the country, uh, to turn the vehicle around, to get the engines ready, to get everything ready to fly. And also to the, uh, to the designers and, and contractors who built that orbiter to operate as it's supposed to operate. Uh, we had the experiments working with just a few minor exceptions working very, very well. And of course, that's due to the hard work of the scientists and principal investigators all over the country who designed their equipment to work properly in that microgravity environment. And then, uh, of course, we were talking to Houston and uh, on the air-to-ground network and, and reminded of the flight control teams that are on the ground taking care of us, looking after us, the training teams that had gotten us ready to fly, uh, and all the people, the rendezvous teams, the flight design teams that put this incredible flight together, this mixture of uh, technology development and, and microgravity science. And it made us, uh, I think I speak for the whole crew, it made us feel very fortunate, uh, very proud to be able to fly in space and um, reap the benefits of all your hard work. It made us feel very, very honored, very privileged to represent you in space because in a sense, we took part of you up there with us. And we'd like to share that with you now and uh, show you some of our uh, movies, uh, some of the sights that we saw up on orbit and looking down on Earth. Uh, before we run the movie, I'd like to introduce the, the rest of the crew. Uh, to my right, pilot Kurt Brown, mission specialist uh, number one, Andy Thomas, mission specialist number two, Dan Bursch, Mission Specialist number three, Mario Runco, and Mission Specialist number four, Mark Garneau. And if we ha could have the movie, please, if we could roll the movie. Well, we're suiting up in our launch and entry suits, getting ready for the, the launch. We had uh, awakened about five hours before launch. Here's Kurt getting a pressure check. Dan. There's Mark. These launch and entry suits protect us uh, if we should lose cabin pressure. They also form part of our survival gear. Walking out of the ONC building at the Cape, getting ready to get on the Astro van and go out to the, uh, to the launch pad. On my right there is Andy Thomas. Andy in the white room up at the 195 level. <laughs> practicing a little bit of his activities there before he gets on board. We had a beautiful morning for the 77th launch of the Space Shuttle program, the first shuttle launch with a full set of the uh, new modified Block 1 engines. At T minus six and a half seconds, the main engine start sequence began, and uh, shortly thereafter, with all three engines up to speed, we're, we're on our way. With the SRB booster ignition, Endeavour was on its 11th mission into space. After clearing the tower, we rolled to the ascent attitude, uh, heads down, which was going to place us in the 39 degree inclination orbit with an altitude of about 160 nautical miles. At this point, Endeavour and all its systems were consuming about 3,000 pounds of fuel and propellant per second, about the weight of your car. For a first time flyer such as myself, the ascent was really an amazing and wonderful experience. I was on the flight deck and I could look out the overhead windows with a wrist mirror and I could see the flame in the flame trench prior to lift off. I could see the flash of the SRB ignition and then feel the lurch as we were accelerated upwards. Into the flight, we saw a flash out the front windows as the SRB separation motors fired, as you can see here. Then we could feel the steady acceleration that carried on, us on up to orbital velocity and orbital altitude. It was a wonderful ride. As soon as we got on orbit, we had to start work. Uh, the first business of the day, as you know, is to open the payload bay doors and expose the radiators that uh, line the doors in order to provide cooling for the spacecraft during its subsequent on-orbit operations. Here you see the starboard door being opened. 
and will be followed shortly by the uh, port door. Uh, in the payload bay there, you can see the Spartan spacecraft and the gold-covered canister, which contains the inflatable antenna, which we will be showing shortly and which we deployed on the second day of the flight. When we first get up on orbit, uh, it is a very busy time after the engine shut down to configure the space, the uh, rocket ship to be uh, an orbital spacecraft. Uh, but the lure of the windows calls, and uh, everybody tries to get to the window to sneak a uh, first view. While the uh, flight deck crew was configuring uh, the ship for on-orbit operations, I was down on the uh, mid-deck doing the same for the systems uh, down there, as well as helping each crew member unsuit and get ready for on-orbit. After the post-insertion phase, uh, Andy Thomas and I were uh, on our way to the space hab, and of course a very exciting moment for us here where we're opening the hatch to the space hab because this is where we're going to spend uh, the majority of the next 10 days and obviously eager to see that everything looks fine and, and certainly from our first look in there it looked uh, as if space hab had uh, traveled very well. Meanwhile, pilot uh, Kurt Brown is in the mid-deck uh, also doing some more configuration uh, on orbit. Here you see the uh, ergometer, which is sort of an exercise bicycle that uh, Kurt is assembling down on the mid-deck. The ergometer is a very popular device uh, used by all of the astronauts, usually on a daily basis, to get a little bit of exercise uh, so that we can strain our muscles a little bit. Also on day one, we had to check out the arm because we were going to use it later on for uh, Spartan deploy and retrieve, and Andy Thomas did all a checkout on day one with the arm and also a payload based survey. After Andy uh checked out the arm and assured me that it would work. I had the good fortune uh, to uh, be in charge of the deploy of the satellite. Uh, here you see a view of uh, the grapple of the satellite, the uh, end effector of the arm coming over the grapple pin. Uh, this is a view from uh, the camera A in the front looking toward the aft, and this is the same view I had because the space hab in the payload bay blocks your view, uh, direct view of uh, this uh, task, so we had to use the camera. What we had to do is lift uh, the spacecraft up uh, to a certain level above the payload bay and then bring it forward. In this case, forward is uh, uh, toward the uh, background of the picture where you see the, the two windows of the cockpit where the, the operation station is. In the course of uh, that evolution, we wound up flying over uh, Egypt. Here you see in the background the Nile River, uh, the Aswan Dam, and Lake Nasser. Uh, that all took place in daylight. Uh, the deploy actually took place uh, as we went around the dark side uh, after sunset. Here you see the deploy. Uh, we'd have to ungrapple the, uh, uh, put the arm in the ungrapple position and then back it away from the spacecraft. And after backing the arm away, uh, John and Kurt then uh, took the orbiter and backed it away from the uh, satellite. The deploy itself was in the night phase, but uh, in the next orbital sunrise, sun sensors which were positioned on the Spartan spacecraft initiated the deployment of the inflatable antenna and its subsequent inflation. As you can imagine, this was a particularly impressive sight. In fact, it was spectacular seeing this from the orbiter. We were just 400 feet away looking down upon the Spartan and we saw this sequence that you can see here. Doors on the Spartan carrier opened and uh, the antenna mylar structure was pushed out into free space as you can see here and then inflation started by filling it with nitrogen <coughs> gas and in a moment you will see uh, one of the legs of the antenna uh, fill out with nitrogen gas, a bit like uh, water in a fire hose, there you see it. Antenna structures like these have a lot of applications. They can be used for antennas for deep space probes, they could be used for radar mapping spacecraft of planets or Earth observations, or they could be used for sun, sen sun shades for uh, orbiting space stations. My crewmates tell me here that the legs look a bit like the number 77 when viewed from Earth. <laughs> <laughs> this deployment and inflation took place as we were crossing the west coast of the United States, and you can see that in the background as we're crossing over California, and in a moment you will see us crossing over the uh, dry lakes of Edwards Air Force Base. You can see the inflation continuing, the last leg of the antenna being deployed. You can see the gyrations that the spacecraft is going through uh, under that action. The antenna, when it was deployed, was uh, nearly 100 feet long, bright silver, and nearly 50 feet in diameter. And since we were only 400 feet away from it, you can imagine that it was a really uh, grand sight to see from, or from orbit. After a few moments, uh, the instabilities created by the inflation 
settled down, transient settled out, and we got uh, uh, a stable antenna in orbit. This shows a view of the canopy itself after the inflation. You can see some ripples following the inflation process. Uh, we tracked it for one orbit while it did self-measurements of its shape, and then we jettisoned the Spartan spacecraft from the antenna. And the next frame will show you the jettison process, and I draw your attention to the canopy disk itself, where you'll see a shock wave that envelops the canopy as the pyros fire and dump the Spartan spacecraft. There, you see it. A bit like striking a 100-foot diameter drum. The jettison took place, uh, again, as we were tracking over the United States. We didn't retrieve the antenna itself. Uh, it subsequently re-entered the atmosphere and burned up uh, a couple of days later. The following day, we went back to retrieve the uh, Spartan itself, which you can see in the lower part of the screen there is a small black speck. And this is our farewell view of the antenna as we're crossing over the Midwest region of the United States. As Andy said, the next day we went back to uh, pick up Spartan. This is a view looking out the overhead window. You see the Spartan um, at a few hundred feet in the optical uh, site. This is now a view looking out a payload bay camera looking straight up. You see the RMS, uh, the robotic arm on the right, and the Spartan on the left, about 100 feet. Uh, Mark Carnot uh, very carefully getting ready to uh, retrieve the Spartan and to grapple it. Uh, the grapple occurred at nighttime, so it was a bit of a challenge for us to adjust the uh, cameras for him. Fortunately, uh, Dan did some adjusting on the camera parameters, and, and we got a good view of the end effector. And here's a view from an aft camera. You see the uh, end effector of the arm moving over the grapple fixture. John did such a great job of bringing uh, Spartan in. It was rock solid. It was a very easy job for me just to move the end effector in over it and, and to close the snares and uh, then to do the rigidization. Uh, you might observe when the rigidization takes place, you're pulling in the Spartan and also the arm sort of goes limp and it looks like everything's sort of shaking around a little bit. But uh, after capturing it, uh, the Spartan uh, folks wanted to have a look at it, so Andy uh, rotated it a little bit and we pointed it at cameras and then we had to put it away. Obviously it had all the data that uh, the Spartan uh, folks wanted to retrieve to analyze after the flight. So there you see the Spartan being put away. It's a very busy time, retrieval. You can see a lot of people on the flight deck, uh, everybody doing part of the job to uh, make sure that uh, we get Spartan back. <laughs> and just in case you'd forgotten what mission number we were. <laughs> very next day, we deployed our uh, second satellite. It's part of an experiment called Pam Stu. Uh, this small satellite weighs about 115 pounds. Um, it's aerodynamically stabilized and magnetically damped. The whole idea is to produce a, a satellite that perhaps doesn't need active stabilization. Uh, what you're looking at right now is the heavy end of the satellite, and we deployed it radially towards uh, the Earth, and eventually that heavy end did uh, orient itself into the velocity vector. Again, it's kind of tough to uh, concentrate on the, on the small satellite in the center when you're passing over sites such as this, uh, North Africa, the coast of Portugal and Spain, and the Straits of Gibraltar that you see at the top uh, of the picture, and coming into the Mediterranean Sea again at the top of the image. The uh, Stu satellite had a series of uh, laser reflectors that were uh, designed to be tracked by a laser in the payload bay. Additionally, uh, I, uh, many of us used a handheld laser in the window um, and this was to give us range information into one of our relative plots that we had on board so we could uh, maintain station keeping with the uh, Stu satellite. We station kept about 2,000 feet behind the satellite, which is something that had never been done before. And we did that three times. Uh, Kurt flew two of those rendezvous uh, in front of the laptops. You see right now Kurt's looking at, uh, to the right-hand side, you see he's looking at a uh, station keeping box that... Um, and they both, John and Kurt, did a great job of keeping us uh, in the station keeping. You see the PAM stew now is only about 20 degrees off. It did end up with about a 20 degree cone. In addition to these rather spectacular satellite deploy and retrieve operations, we also were lucky enough to have a space hab module uh, in the payload bay, which provided us a lot of room to conduct some scientific experiments. Uh, here you see Mark working on one, a crystal growth furnace that ran very successfully throughout the flight. And Dan and I working on uh, various experiments in the space hub. We had 12 experiments in all, 
uh, looking at the effect of microgravity on uh, physical processes, uh, material science, and some uh, biological or biotechnology samples. It's a very good working environment to have the Space Hab module, and uh, uh, we enjoyed working back there. Some of the experiments were mounted in the mid-deck, and here you see Mario activating one of the biotechnology experiments that we carried in the mid-deck for this flight. And of course, we had our usual uh, unofficial experiments. Here we have the, the ball of water with uh, a ball of air that's been injected into it. And a good demonstration of physics. One image is inverted, and the other is uh, back upright. And uh, about this time, Dan was getting thirsty and asked me to prepare a tropical punch ball, which uh, he uh, very adroitly <laughs> took care of. Well, as with most of our shuttle missions, our on-orbit timeline was uh, very busy thanks to our flight activity officers. And However, we did <laughs> find some time uh, to uh, have some meals together and share our experiences on orbit. The mid-deck is quite small, but on orbit, uh, with six people, you're able to uh, take available all space. Also, other activities, taking care of the morning mail from Earth uh, for upcoming rendezvous. Andy's busy typing some uh, family mail to be sent back down to Earth at uh, next available opportunity. And on the mid-deck, John is busy exercising. Again, we all try to stay in good shape for our inev inevitable return to uh, Earth. And Mario is putting away the vacuum cleaner. He's uh, been busy doing some scheduled maintenance that we do each day to, to keep the orbiter atmosphere in pristine shape. Mar uh, excuse me, Andy wasn't quite that busy. He was catching <laughs> some sleep. Uh, back in the space hab, this is our sleeping configuration in the sleeping bag with a head restraint and a little eye patch and relaxed uh, with the bungees across to give you some pressure in the middle. Uh, personal hygiene is always a challenge in space. Uh, Dan here is working with some contact lenses. Um, we do use contacts in space, and they work quite well, well in the zero-g environment. And, uh, and there you go. I think Andy and the flight design team got together to plan STS-77 so it would pass very frequently over Australia, shown here. Uh, this is a view of the northwest coast, uh, Sharks Bay specifically, uh, rather spectacular. Just to, when you look at the Earth, the blues and greens are just spectacular. Here you see from our low light level camera looking down at the Earth over Florida specifically, the flashes you see are lightning flashes from a, a line of thunderstorms that were passing over the state at that time. And in the center on the left there, that, uh, those lights are cities, and that one moving off the top of the screen now is Tallahassee. Here you see a view, a rather spectacular one, moving over uh, Mexico. This is a view looking over the Rockies uh, westward. Uh, toward the Gulf of California, Baja, California, and out in the distance, the uh, deep blue of the Pacific Ocean. Unfortunately, all great missions have to come to an end, and uh, that's signaled rather dramatically by the closing of the payload bay doors, which you see here, the starboard door coming in to close. And you can see Spartan not looking quite so big in the payload bay now that it's lost its uh, inflatable antenna. But uh, we proceeded through the deorbit. Uh, prep phase, as it's known. Uh, this was choreographed by Mario rather well, and uh, he's taking care of uh, people putting on their, their suits. I won't describe the feeling of uh, sticking your head through. You probably can imagine what it's like, but obviously we have to wear these suits. And uh, here we have our pilot, Kurt Brown, and looking out the window to his right, you can see the orange glow that's beginning to increase. And this is an overhead uh, view through uh, an overhead window, and you can see those uh, those uh, light, sh uh, the light show that's going on, sometimes rather spectacular as uh, arcing takes place in the plasma above you. Uh, we're now getting back into gravity. As you can see, John is holding this cue card up, and it's about a half a G. In this shot, we've slowed down from our orbital speed of 17,500 miles an hour to about 300 miles an hour, and I'm hand flying the orbiter around the heading alignment circle at about four to five miles above the uh, shuttle landing facility. It's always amazing to me that uh, this vehicle, which has been our on-orbit uh, laboratory and, and spaceship, now is configured and comes down and lands like an airplane, with, of course, one big exception. There are no engines running, so we're a high-speed glider, but uh, very, very versatile uh, spacecraft and, of course, the only one in the world that, will, that can come back and land on a prepared runway. Touching down here a little over 200 miles an hour, uh, we'll deploy the drag chute to uh, help us slow down. Our flight had covered about 4.1 million miles, 
We're uh, trying to file for frequent flyer miles. <laughs> and we've been around the Earth 160 times. The total flight duration was a little over 10 days. And as you can see, it was beautiful weather at the Cape. On-time launch, on-time landing at first attempt. As we roll out uh, to about 60 miles an hour jettison the drag chute. And a very happy crew after the flight. Well, we've got a few uh, slides that we'd like to show you of uh, some of the Earth views that uh, we weren't, were not able to capture for you on the film. I would just like to make a special thanks to Glenn Peterson from the Photo Lab who put this uh, video together for us. A lot of uh, long hours, and thank you very much for that effort. Our mission patch. And a unique view of the orbiter rollout uh, as it's rolling out to the Cape about two weeks before the launch. Dramatic view of the sunrise launch. Launched at 6.30 in the morning just as the sun was coming up. One of my favorite photos. And a, uh, a, a rather dramatic earth shot here of the, uh, uh, some of the views that we saw there with the Spartan on the, on the arm. This is a, you've seen the uh, inflatable antenna, but we wanted to show you this slide because it's over the Grand Canyon. And if you can notice through the middle of the uh, picture, just slightly to the left, behind the uh, inflatable antenna is the uh, Grand Canyon. Very beautiful in this sunrise shot. And then later on in that same sequence, we were passing over the United States during this, uh, after the deploy, or after the inflation of the antenna. This is the uh, Norfolk, Virginia area, Chesapeake Bay on the right, running up to the top of the photograph. And uh, some of that area, the Rappahannock River at the top, York River, James River behind the uh, antenna. Um, although I don't actually sound it, of course, I am American, but I was raised in Australia. And this flight was a splendid opportunity to see the country where I grew up. And this is a view of the uh, south coast of southern Australia from orbit. And we had some spectacular passes over Australia every morning. The crew would alert me when we were coming by so I could get some pictures. And this is the area of South Australia where I grew up. Um, flying over Australia is interesting because if you ever visit Australia and you go to the outback, it seems very desolate and not much topography. But when you see it from orbit, it's really very impressive, as the next slide will show. This is a view of an area in the Northern Territory of Australia uh, called the McDonnell Ranges in that wavy form that you see across the center part of the slide. But what is unique here is if you look in the upper part of the slide, you can see a feature which is known as Goss's Bluff. But it's actually an impact crater from an ancient uh, meteor impact. Um, this crater is thought to be about 140 million years old. Uh, and it's about 22 kilometers in diameter. So it's a very large feature. Um, in the countryside, but as you can see, there is a lot of uh, texture and coloring in the outback of Australia. Uh, the next slide shows the countryside we saw following Australia, which was New Zealand. And one of the amazing things is you go from this desolate region of Australia to this lush region of New Zealand, and you're struck by the amazing uh, uh, geography of New Zealand with its uh, jagged mountains and snow-covered peaks and very rough terrain. And this is a volcano in New Zealand called Mount Raapiu, and this actually is an active volcano. It uh, last erupted uh, sometime last year, with some loss of life, actually. Um, and it's still uh, issuing steam and mud as an active volcanic site. Uh, it was very impressive to see these kinds of volcanoes from orbit. As Andy mentioned, the, the volcanoes do catch your eye. And here is one shown over uh, the high altiplano of the, of the northern part of Chile in, in South America in the center, uh, central part of the screen toward the top there. What caught our eye was the steam plume emanating from the volcano you see here. And interestingly enough, this volcano was photographed by the crew of STS-55 back in April of 1993. And at that time, the volcano had erupted and uh, put out uh, a, a large uh, 
ash cloud, as well as a lava flow. Now, the lava flow flows north here toward the top of the uh, picture, and then it turns left. And what's interesting, in, in just the three years' time since the eruption, unlike the ancient uh, crater uh, that Andy just showed you in, in Australia that, that has not changed its character very much because of the very dry climate there, uh, this climate being very wet, the, the gray feature of the lava flow has uh, all but disappeared, and now it's uh, covered over and, and appears to take on the uh, hue of the surrounding countryside as, uh, as erosion takes place. And uh, we had a quick shot of uh, this view in the film. This is a view uh, looking westward across the western Mediterranean Sea, uh, the Alboran Sea being the western extent of uh, the Mediterranean, the Strait of Gibraltar. Uh, the Rock of Gibraltar is actually uh, off the uh, peninsula that emanates from the right side, from the coast of Spain there, uh, sticking out into the water to the left. Uh, uh, the Rock of Gibraltar and that part of uh, Gibraltar is a, uh, a territory of Great Britain. Uh, Morocco is to the left, and the Atlantic Ocean is out uh, in the background of the picture toward the top. Rather spectacular view, and, and sometimes we like to look in great detail, uh, as you've seen in the last couple of photographs, and, and sometimes just the panoramas uh, take your breath away. And here, uh, another panorama, although there's a great bit of detail in here. This is of the Sinai and Israel. Uh, you can see uh, the, the Dead Sea Rift Valley here the Dead Sea being uh, in the northern part of uh, uh, the photograph. The Dead Sea uh, had opened, had a, uh, is about 1,300 feet below sea level, and it had, there was a passage that had opened to the sea many millions of years ago. That passage is closed up, and the water is now uh, remaining there, and that uh, is the cause for the high uh, saline content, as much of it is eroded and is now fed very uh, uh, meagerly by uh, streams and, and underground springs. The Rift Valley extends southward to the Gulf of Aqaba here. And interestingly enough, if you can make it out uh, uh, to the left center of the picture, there's a diagonal line very faintly showing across here, which is actually the southern border of Israel. And even though this is a political boundary, we can see it. And, and the differentiation there is between the land use patterns, the irrigation that goes on to the north of that border, and the, and the lack of irrigation or the natural desert state to the south of, of that border. And uh, very close to the last slide that uh, Mario just described is another one that uh, shows a lot of Egypt. It uh, doesn't matter what inclination you're on, uh, you're generally always going to go over this part of the world and it's always going to have uh, clear weather, so you get a good view of it. And it, it's particularly uh, attractive uh, because of the, uh, the history of the location and also because of the contrast between the very green triangle uh, which is at the top center, which represents the Nile Delta, and you can see it threading down towards the uh, bottom left, uh, more like a ribbon as it uh, works its way into the very dry part of northern Africa. Uh, at the apex of the green triangle, just a little bit to the right is Cairo, and a little bit uh, to its left uh, is the uh, location where the pyramids of Egypt are, are uh, located. As well, you can see over on the right side uh, the famous Gulf of Suez, which uh, up in the right-hand corner empties into the Mediterranean at Port Said. And uh, the lake that's halfway down the uh, uh, Suez Canal, Great Bitter Lake, and finally going further down, uh, emptying into the uh, Gulf of Suez. Always a very uh, striking part of the world to fly over. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, one of the uh, most uh, startling uh, set of islands that uh, we have on our planet are the Galapagos Islands, which uh, are off the west coast of South America. And uh, we were fortunate in being able to see them several times in a cloud-free situation. Uh, the biggest island is quite striking because it does look like a, a horse's uh, head. And uh, it, if you went from the bottom of its body towards the top, you'd be pointing in the northerly direction. And of course, this is a, uh, a set of islands that became famous because Charles Darwin uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time there in the, n the 19th century uh, looking at the unique animal and bird life on these islands. And it, and it was this animal life that helped him to, uh, to uh, develop his uh, theories on the evolution of the spe species and, and natural selection. And, and even today, uh, uh, there are still unique life forms. 
life forms on this island, on these islands. Next slide, please. Well, this one is a little bit difficult to see, but it's very important to me because as a Canadian, I was not uh, going to be allowed to go back up to Canada unless I showed everybody that I'd seen some of Canada during my mission. If you look up in the top left corner, uh, you can actually see uh, some of Lake Ontario. And I have to admit, I did not see this view, and uh, I'm very grateful to uh, my colleague Dan who took this picture because he's also from New York, and I'll let him describe the other part of it. It wasn't until we were in space that I realized how close uh, the areas that were our hometowns were where we grew up because uh, where Mark uh, grew up on the northern part of this slide or the top part of this slide, I grew up in the south part. You see these are some of the river valleys down to the bottom. This is actually the Susquehanna River right here, river valley towards the uh, uh, bottom center and, and left of the, of the photo. Um, my hometown is just in, in the lower uh, left center of the picture near Binghamton, New York, actually Vestal, New York, and, and uh, fortunately this was an early morning uh, pass. It's why it's a little bit, a bit hazy and how the fog still uh, uh, lingers in the river valley. So Shenango uh, River right there. Next slide. Um, it seemed like every time, uh, a few hours after we woke up, we always had a west coast pass uh, very close to uh, San Francisco. Uh, you see the orbiter tail, and just to the left of the tail, you can see uh, San Francisco Bay, uh, Golden Gate Bridge. You can't quite make it out in the photo here. Just to the right of the tail is Monterey Bay, if anybody's ever been in that uh, part of California. And uh, uh, actually, you can see some of the, uh, the surface waves uh, approaching the, uh, the mouth of the San Francisco Bay. Next slide. This is the uh, town of El Paso. El Paso happens to be one of the oldest set settlements in North America. It was first uh, settled in uh, 1598. Uh, it got its name from El Paso del Norte, from the Spanish. Uh, it was a pass through the, the uh, Rocky Mountains. This part of the mountains, extension of the Rocky Mountains, is called the Franklin Mountains. Um, the river itself, if, you've, um, if you follow kind of like the dark area, and avoiding uh, the mountains itself, but the dark area comes down here, and that's uh, the Rio Grande. Um, we fly out to El Paso a lot. It's, we routinely stop there when we fly out to the west coast. The pilots fly there all the time because they use it kind of as a fueling stop where they pick up the STA, and then they fly to the north. North is, is to the upper right part of the photo, and where they fly towards uh, New Mexico in white sands and, and do a lot of their training runs in the STA there. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture a little bit closer to home. Uh, towards the bottom, you see the coast. This is uh, uh, Galveston Island, right in the middle. Uh, I believe this was about in the middle of the flight. You see some of the puffy clouds, which, and I, I remember this day, I called down to, to MCC and I said, uh, looks like a clear day, but the only word that came back was says, uh, uh, Bill MacArthur said, yeah, but it's hot. So I think that's when you all were having some uh, 90 plus uh, degree weather at that time while we're uh, in orbit. You can see this is a, a dike that extends out, um, and uh, also here's the, uh, the causeway that goes over to Galveston Island itself, just in the lower uh, uh, center part of the picture. Next slide. This slide is a, um, an example of one of the techniques that we use in Earth Ops observations. Uh, we call it sun glint. We use the reflection of the sun off the surface of water bodies on the Earth to uh, gather more detail. With that glint, we're able to see uh, the activities and the condition of the surface of the water. This particular shot is taken of the west coast of Florida, uh, of the Florida Peninsula, I should say. Uh, the little island you see dead center of the photo is uh, uh, Sanibel Island, and Fort Myers is just uh, to the north or just above that on the coast, and then Naples, Florida is on the far right of the coast. But with the sun glint on the surface of the water, we're able to see um, quite a bit of activity in this shot. This uh, occurred on uh, Sunday afternoon, and you can see all the uh, pleasure boaters out, the uh, little V wakes, which is actually the real wake behind the boat. We're able to uh, gather a lot of information about activities and uh, conditions of the water from shots like this. One of our most favorite uh, shots here is, uh, I'm sure everyone recognizes, is the uh, our launch or departure site from, from Earth. 
uh, almost dead center of the photo, you can see the shuttle landing facility, the little straight line, about a 15,000 foot long runway. And if you look a little bit to the right of that, along the coast of uh, the uh, land there, the uh, Atlantic, you can see pad Bravo and Alpha pad 39 that we had departed from the northernmost pad. And you can see the crawler tracks that lead out to the pad from the vertical assembly building. Uh, if you look a little bit south of that, the little uh, cape that sticks out, Cape Canaveral, you can see all the uh, launch pads that have played uh, such an important part of our history in the space program uh, during the, the early days of, of uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. You can see uh, the town of Titusville and also within the bodies of water about center of the photo, you can actually see the intercoastal waterway that uh, the ships used to get up and down the uh, Atlantic coast. This is a good shot of landing. Uh, after 10 days of a very successful and a very exciting mission, we obviously have to come back to Earth. And uh, we landed on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center. The weather was uh, uh, very nice and early morning, right after sunrise type landing. And, and John did an excellent job bringing us all home safely. And um, we're very happy and sad, happy to be back home to our loved ones, but very sad to uh, have completed uh, our short stay in space, looking forward to our, our next trip. Here's another shot of the crew out in front of the orbiter, about an hour after uh, landing and uh, giving the traditional thumbs up. Again, happy to uh, be back safely after an amazing and very successful 10 days on orbit. Our uh, closing slide is a, a sun, sunset shot of uh, looking across Australia. And in, uh, in closing, I would like to again thank all of you for uh, coming here today and uh, for the part that you played your, in this mission, your, your dedication, your hard work. And I'd ask you to keep it up because uh, STS-77 is, is now history. We've got STS-78 on the launch pad ready to go. And uh, next year, we look forward to launching the first component of the International Space Station. So we've got a, a lot going on in the future, and I would ask you all to keep up the good work. All the great work that you put in for STS-77, keep it up. We need your help. Thank you.